Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Philosophy. This week, Dan Lynch joins me. We're going to talk about HPCC systems for high-performance computing. If you have big data, you're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 228, recorded October 3rd, 2012. HPCC Systems. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, Libre, open source software. I'm your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneHinge.com, coming to you each week, or as often as I can get here, the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the small projects, the projects you probably heard all about, the projects you might not know anything about, like maybe today's project. But before we get started, let's go ahead and bring on our co-host, Dan Lynch. Welcome back to the show. Thanks very much. It's always a pleasure to be here. Very cool. And uh, if I... I look a little bit this time it's because I'm speaking to you from New Orleans. And in New Orleans, we do things differently. Like we don't have our big mic to talk in. I have this little uh, portable headset I'm speaking to. So if I sound a little bit differently, it's because of that. I also, uh, I, I've got a really bad connection here. So uh, perhaps during the show, you might hear some dropouts from me. I'm really sorry about that, but this is the best I could do. My, my little uh, clear wire card wouldn't work here. So I have, I'm relying on the hotel Wi-Fi, which is really sucky, but uh, well, hopefully it'll hold in for most of it. It probably even dropped out right while I was talking about this. What a deal. Uh, Dan, we've got a real interesting guest today. We've got Dr. Flavio Villanustri. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He's going to talk to us about PCC systems, which is high-performance computing. So this is the people that have to process big data, crunch stuff in and out, and do the map reduce operations and, and data queries. This is the kind of thing you would use if you're searching through a lot of data. And it looks like He's, uh, Dr. Uh, Villadustri has got a huge history, a real history in open source, so we've got to talk to him a little bit about that. Uh, what do you know about this so far, Dan? Uh, only what I've been researching in the last couple of days, I've got to be honest. But, um, yeah, it, it looks really interesting. Obviously, big data is a bit of a buzzword right now, but uh, basically if you've got, like, petabytes of data or, or, or more and you need to analyze them, you need some kind of system that, that's going to be able to handle that. And uh, a lot of systems can't, and that's what that's what they're trying to deal with. So I'm really interested. I don't have quite that much data. My DVD collection is not that big. Um, I don't know what else I could use for that kind of data. But maybe a book book collection. I don't know. But uh, yeah, it sounds fascinating, and I can't wait to hear more about it. Maybe I could just index my spam. I know I've got enough big data there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tons. Yeah, tons of spam. Well, uh, I think well, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on our guest. I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Dr. Flavio Villanustra. Welcome to the show. That is correct. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Very good. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, you're just down the street. I'm I'm in New Orleans. So we could can you can you see me wave? No, just kidding. Just kidding. it's a little further away than that. Oh yeah, <laughs> but... I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Got big All hands. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I introduced the HPCC systems at the beginning of the show. It probably did a horrible job of it. Let's uh, hear it directly from the expert. Can you give us the overview of what we're going to be talking about today? Absolutely. HPCC systems is a platform for data-intensive computing. It has been uh, released under an open source license last year, but it has been developed and used over the last 12 or 13 years by LexisNexis Resolutions. Uh, LexisNexis, I don't know if, if you know much about the company, uh, it is not the car manufacturer, so if you have a Lexus, that this didn't come from us, but uh, we do uh, data intensive computing and provide data solutions and data services, uh, mostly US focused, but we have some also footprint internationally as well. Uh, well the, what I'm from in terms of Lexus, this is the, uh, this is some sort of data search service, like searching for legal records or, or news records or something. Is that is that the same company? Well, that is the, uh, there are two companies called LexisNexis within the same group. We are both owned by Real Elsevier, a worldwide publisher uh, of, uh, of books, exhibitions, and, and, and research papers and patents and other, other businesses. Uh, the uh, LexisNexis uh, that does the legal, the case law, uh, analytics and uh, and all the uh, news information is uh, is our sister company. They also use the platform across their entire editorial system for for case law, where they do the heavy analytics. 
But the uh, unit that I mean, the uh, LexisNexis Risk Solutions unit, is about uh, information about identities and uh, risk and, and fraud. Essentially, uh, we provide uh, services to a large number of corporate customers in the U.S. Uh, this is uh, many, many thousand customers. And, uh, and they use our services uh, to uh, assess risk, for example, for example, for financial transactions or law enforcement or uh, many other verticals, healthcare and, uh, and legal and others. Okay, so what's the, what's the software we're talking about? It's, it's big data. I know that's a nice buzzword, but can you sort of describe the kinds of problems that you're solving with this kind of software? Absolutely. We, uh, when we started about 13 or 15 years ago, we were using traditional solutions, essentially RDBMS systems and, uh, and traditional application servers uh, of the time. But many of the analytics that we do on data uh, and, and also the size of the data weren't necessarily at the uh, sweet spot for those type of platforms. So it didn't really scale for us. Some of the processes that we do are quite complex. Many of them required a machine learning type of, of process, including clustering analysis and, and others. Uh, and, uh, and no traditional solutions could uh, be up for the challenge. So we decided to build our own platform uh, at the time, this is back in 1999 or so, we thought that using a divide and conquer type of approach where we could segment the data across multiple commodity nodes and process this data, if we could, as much as uh, possible locally on the nodes by moving the algorithm to where the data resides, it could be a lot more functional uh, and, uh, and a lot more performing than, than the uh, traditional solutions that are mostly centralized. So. Based on this type of premise, uh, we came up with our own platform. At, uh, to put it in perspective, other platforms that do this, uh, like for example, Hadoop and other open source solutions, didn't come up until much later. It wasn't until 2004, December of 2004, where two uh, Google researchers came up with a paper on, on distributed computing using map reduce paradigm. So this uh, came several years earlier. Now. We were very protective of this solution because uh, it is what we do. It is uh, the core of our business and our competitive advantage. But uh, just a couple of years ago or three years ago, we started discussing the possibility of open sourcing it. And open sourcing it to gather adoption, to uh, foster a, a more widespread use of the platform, look for new use cases, and uh, essentially get the, uh, all the benefits that you get from uh, an open source community. The ability to share uh, development, the ability to uh, apply uh, this platform in, in uh, problems that are not necessarily equivalent to what we do. Uh, and, uh, and to put it in uh, a little bit of a context, there are two components to this platform. There is a component that does massive data analytics, batch oriented, mostly single or, or, or dual queue type of, of system. So you have one process at a time. This process does all the uh, data uh, profiling, normalization, standardization, uh, data linking. And, and when I say data linking, I am talking about uh, inverse document frequency type of linking, not necessarily exact matching, which is something that you could do with, uh, mo mo with any other solution, essentially. And, uh, and then another component, which is a real-time delivery system uh, that provides for all the uh, real-time access. These two systems are uh, based on the same exact platform. They use share nothing architectures. So they use uh, commodity nodes running Linux, and we support a number of different Linux distributions, uh, including Red Hat, CentOS, SUSE, Debian, Ubuntu, and, and others. And, um, and uh, they uh, both uh, have the same type of paradigm where data is uh, segmented across the nodes, and the process runs across the nodes by moving the algorithms to where the data resides. Of course, there are moments where you need to move data across the nodes. Uh, for example, when you do a large sort, a distributed sort across the system, but, uh, but we try to avoid data moves as much as possible. The network interconnect is just IP-based, so any IP network, Ethernet, or, or inf IP over infinity band will, will work. Hmm. So, Flavio, you mentioned uh, Hadoop there, which wasn't around, you were saying, at the time when you were building this, but I, I was just doing some research on your website earlier today, and I noticed there's a big banner that advertises Hadoop integration. So can you tell us a little bit about that? How does that work? That works uh, by allowing uh, HPCC to get uh, data from HDFS file systems and store data back into HDFS file systems. We uh, think that there is a benefit for those using Hadoop currently 
uh, from uh, use, leveraging some of the capabilities in HPCC that might not be readily available in Hadoop. So by being able to access the data and the format it is uh, from the HD face file system itself, uh, we essentially avoid the need to have an external landing zone to move your big data files into, into it to be able to then load them back into HPCC. So essentially saves time and makes for a more transparent data access across these two systems. So essentially HDFS read uh, and write access from within uh, HPCC for people using mm. HDFS for their main data stores. Yeah, cool. And um, I'm curious to know, how, what, how does this scale? I mean, you mentioned the fact that you're using uh, a lot of nodes there with the share uh, nothing uh, principle. So I imagine you can just spin up extra nodes and so on. But how does this scale? And what's your kind of biggest um, installation maybe that, you, that you're using right now or that you know of? Well, I think our, the bigger customer is ourselves. <laughs> we have a, okay. between 5,000 and 35,000 nodes across our data centers. Uh, but of course, not in a single cluster. I didn't mention it, but uh, HVCC has the ability to do remote reads from other clusters. So our larger cluster, uh, and this again, depends on, uh, on the type of application that you have. But in our case, it's about 400 nodes. Uh, but as you can imagine, 25,000 nodes means that we have many of these clusters distributed across the, uh, the different data centers. Um, mm. The, uh, the uh, two platforms that I mentioned, the one for backend processing and the one for real-time uh, highly concurrent data delivery, uh, are normally sized equivalently, although the backend platform tends to have more nodes. And this is because you normally need more capacity on the back end as you are doing a lot of uh, data processes with intermediate results. And the front end system just needs the uh, index data ready to be delivered. What I didn't mention mm. before, uh, and I think this is important, is the fact that we, uh, when we decided to build this the, at the design time, we were looking for a viable programming language, something that would allow us to do all these data transformations and data queries. Now, the only language that we had at, the, at, the ha at hand was SQL, and SQL is kind of okay when you're doing data queries, but it's not easy to express data transformations unless you get into uh, custom flavors of SQL. And even then, SQL doesn't allow very well for data uh, and code encapsulation or, or, or code reuse, easy code reuse and other things. So we decided to build our own high-level programming language. It's a data flow-oriented uh, language called ECL, Enterprise Control Language. And this language, is uh, available on both sides, on the backend system on Thor, which is the uh, backend massive per, uh, parallel system, and also on the uh, front end real time delivery system called Roxy. So ECL is the uh, language that allows you to define a data workflow on Thor and also define a data query, a parameterized data query on Roxy. Mm. So uh, I'm curious to know more about ECL then. So if I mean, I've done a lot of traditional kind of database stuff with, with SQL and, and so on. So how difficult would it be for me to transfer skills? Are there similarities between the two languages, or is it going to be like a whole new learning process for me? No, it is not a, hu a whole new learning process. ECL, uh, same as SQL, is a declarative uh, paradigm. So uh, you tell the system what needs to be done rather than how to do it. And I know I'm also a control freak. Uh, I, I programmed in, in imperative <laughs> language my life, so <laughs> including Perl. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, I know that there may be some, uh, some uh, learning curve there to change the way you think and, and, and let the uh, system decide to optimize the code in the best way as long as you can express the uh, uh, type of results that you're expecting. Like in SQL, when you say select mm. uh, these uh, values or, or these columns from uh, these tables where uh, there is some uh, type of, uh, of, of pattern, well, in ECL, you do something very similar. In a, in a filter statement, in this case, it would be just a, a, the a data set name and parentheses with the filter specific, the specific filter that you want to apply. So it is quite equivalent to SQL. Now, it is a lot more powerful. ECL it has a, it avoids, for example, side effects. So you can very easily do code reuse without the fear of, uh, of uh, having a, calling a function that might return a different result, not based on the parameters that you're passing, but on some other global value stored magically somewhere. It also provides for data and code encapsulation. So you build new functions in ECL that either encapsulate code or code and data, and you can call those functions uh, later on. So to have 
uh, essentially well-defined interfaces. And you can change the details of the implementation of those functions later, as long as you maintain the interfaces, and your main processes will still work fine. And again, without side effects, it's easy to document and, uh, and reuse those functions across a team. We have also a number of other uh, advanced capabilities, including, uh, for example, the fact that we do lazy evaluation. And you probably are familiar with this in, from languages like Haskell and, and other functional languages, where things that don't need to be evaluated because they don't have any impact on the end result are not evaluated by default. And the optimizer is uh, make sure that this, is, this happens. Just by the way, the uh, core platform developers uh, from this platform for the last 12 or 13 years, used to be originally the developers that developed Turo Pascal from Borland. So you get an idea where they're oh, right. coming from, especially compiler <laughs> uh, developers. Right, excellent. Um, and uh, I was just curious, is there a, like a command line interface for this so I could like do some queries to just test them out ad hoc, or is it always through some kind of um, interface through a language as well? Yeah, absolutely. There is a command line interface and, uh, and there is an API. On 4, uh, we have a web service type of interface where you can submit your own, your, your own queries, even semi-interactive queries, with the, the uh, reservation that Thor will do one at a time, of course, or, or two at a time if you have to choose. Uh, on Roxy, of course, the same way on web service interfaces, and you can run essentially as, a, as many as, as the system will, will scale to, and, and this is tens of thousands of, mm. of queries simultaneously, depending on the number of nodes and the complexity of the queries. Uh, and uh, and uh, obviously there is, a, there is an IDE and, and we have a, an initial module for Eclipse. So if you're familiar with Eclipse and you like Eclipse, that's a good option. Mm -hmm. And we have our own ACL IDE that we uh, used over the years. We are trying to move to the Eclipse IDE as the final uh, and, 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 and future proof IDE. But uh, in the meantime, we have both options available. Uh, uh, in addition to the uh, web service interface, we have also JSON and JDBC interfaces. And, and on the web services side, are, we have full SOAP with WSDL interfaces and, and RESTful interfaces on, on the system. So there, is a, there are a variety of, uh, of ways to access the system in a programmatic way without needing to use uh, any IDE. But you could use mm -hmm. IDEs as well. Right, okay, excellent. And um, <clears throat> I'm curious to know if anybody else uses this language. Is it How close is it tied to, to the company and the platform zone? Is it under a, an open license? Do you know of other projects that use it? Would it be useful to other people? Or is it strictly kind of a thing that's mainly used by you guys? The idea behind the uh, open source project, uh, as I said before, was to uh, foster widespread adoption of the platform and the language. So we released mm -hmm. the language under a Creative Commons license uh, and, uh, and the entire platform was released under a GPL license, which we are moving now to Apache uh, for the release uh, 310, which is uh, upcoming in the next month or so. So uh, both are, are essentially uh, able to be forked and, and, and implemented in, across other, other environments. I'm not aware of ECL being implemented across any other environments, uh, but but that's a possibility, certainly. Anyone could take ECL and, uh, and now, based on the specifications and, and the documentation that is uh, under the Creative Commons license, they could re-implement it for some other platform. Mm. And what you mentioned briefly there that you're moving from uh, a GPL license to Apache. So what's the thinking behind that? Is there some reason why you need to use a permissive license or you feel the, there'll be a benefit to that? Well, initially, and, and this probably comes from my own history, I, I've been a, a proponent for open source for the last, I don't know, 15 years or more. Uh, I funded the, founded the uh, Buenos Aires Linux user group back in 1994, so you get the, uh, the idea of for how long. But, uh, but uh, and I've been always uh, uh, quite versed in GPL, and I always liked the idea that they give the uh, control to the end user. Essentially, the end user can request to get all the source code for the application that the end user is using or, or, or getting, and they have the entitled to that, that source code. So I think it's a, it's a nice uh, way to ensure that the software remains free. And not free of charge, it's uh, free as uh, giving you freedom. But on the other hand, it imposes restrictions on companies. Companies that are trying to fork the code and, and, or commercialize the code in some way, if they are uh, applying extensions to the code or providing services uh, on, on the code, they might be forced, or linking to the code, forced to release their own proprietary code as well under the same license. On one side, it gives a lot of freedom to the end user, but on the other side, it restricts the freedom from the companies trying to use it. Since this software is mostly a software that 
corporate entities would use more than individual users because uh, this is about big data and there are not that many individual users that might want to uh, process their, their, I don't know, their CD or video collection on HPCC. So uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, an Apache license is more attractive and that's why we made the move over the last couple of months. Okay, cool. And um, you mentioned there that the, um, <clears throat> there's a difference between the, the different kind of editions. So what are the what are the main differences between the different editions of the, of the platform that you've got, or the different editions of the software, I should say? Well, I mentioned that there are two components. A component that is a backend, a massive uh, data analytics platform on, on, on data cleansing and hygiene, not, all the normalization, standardization, which is called FOR. FOR is the uh, name of the Nordic God of Thunder, the one with the big hammer. We say that the hammer is to submit to, to Hammer data into submission to make sure that the data will do will obey your will, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and this is a mostly single threaded platform. It is a extremely uh, high performing. I didn't mention it before, but ECL is compiled to C plus plus and and to machine code as you submit the ECL transformation or ECL query. So when you submit your program on the fly, ECL gets a obviously go through the optimizer, which uh, looks for what you are trying to accomplish and builds the best execution plan. And it compiles it to C++ and machine code. The execution plan mm-hmm. is displayed back on a, on a web interface to you if you want to look at it uh, in a graphical manner. So it's a number of boxes that depict the activities that you are, you are asking the system to perform and uh, group them in subgraphs. And those subgraphs are built in a way that they allow for all these activities to be parallelized. Now, these graphs, execution plans, are dynamic. As data traverses the execution plans, the numbers in the edges reflect the number of records that went through, and also the data skews across the nodes. How many more records does the node with the largest number of records have versus the average, and how many less records does the, num- the node with the least number of records have versus the average, which is very useful when you're trying to optimize algorithms. And an important feature is that many of the algorithms that we built, like for example, the global sort, are uh, very well thought trying to avoid data skews. Data skews in a system that is distributed where the system will be as slow as the slowest node, it is important to ensure that all the nodes get an, about the similar number of records to process. And, uh, and avoiding data skews, and, and sort is one of the cases, is, uh, is key. In, in other systems, you may see people using for a distributed sort, a radix sort, for example, which will work very well if your data is uh, evenly distributed across the key space that you are, you are using for the distribution. But it doesn't work if you have, for example, a phone book data. And if you are sorting by the last name, in the mm-hmm. U.S., you might have a lot of names, last names starting with A's and B's, but I don't think you will have too many names starting with the X's, for example. So if you have 26 nodes, the node with the uh, X's will have only a few records versus the node with the A's and B's and C's which have a lot of records. So sort, for example, will compute a histogram of distribution across the main key or the, the main keys, and then it will decide which nodes should receive the particular pieces of the key space, the partitions, in order to ensure that you have an even distribution across the node. So each node receives an, ab- an about the same number of records. On the Ruxy side, the, most of the, uh, the benefits are around the high availability and the uh, performance, of course, of the system. The uh, fact that Ruxy has a uh, share nothing architecture and has no single point of failure, and every node is able to essentially uh, perform uh, the uh, the function independently from the others means that you can mm-hmm. uh, rely on the system. And as long as you provide for enough copies of the data and you define what this ratio is, you may lose a lot of nodes and still have the system fully functional, which is key for our, our business. I didn't say before, but we have a, we, our uh, Lexus resolution business specifically is about $1.5 billion in revenue on an annual basis. And a hundred percent of this revenue comes from systems that are relying on this platform. So high availability and their online service. So high availability is key for our own operation. Hmm. And what, what's, well, that leads us quite nicely into, um, well, what's the kind of split between, um, you know, you mentioned that you, you could install this yourself, you get the software and install it. So how many, how many uh, say, customers would want to run the system themselves and how many will come to you and just have you host it uh, for them? Is it, what's the kind of split like on that? 
That, that is a hard question. Of course, we provide a lot of data services. So many customers that also require data that we have uh, might prefer to host the system with us or, provide, or have some sort of service on the system rather than host it themselves. But there are many cases, and this is uh, either because customers try to do data processing that has nothing to do with the data that we handle, or because their data is too sensitive to be moved around and they don't want to get it off their offices or their data center or because they are completely out of the U.S., so they are not U.S.-based, they wouldn't leverage at all the uh, data that we have, but they do need to have a system of this, uh, of this type to do their own data processing. Okay, so that, that leads us quite nicely into the, uh, the next question, which is, I was wondering, you can get the software and host it yourself, um, or you can get it hosted by, uh, by yourselves as a service. So um, what's the kind of differential like between people who want to run it themselves and people who want to uh, get a hosted solution maybe from, from yourselves? There are a few different variables there, and uh, and one of those is the fact that we have a, a substantial amount of data that some customers might be able to leverage. If that's the case, uh, in order to prevent moving the data around, they might uh, want to have us host a service for them, so we can host an HPCC and add our data centers. But in many other cases, there are customers that either because they can't move their data around and they want to process their own data, and or because they have they wouldn't leverage our data at all, maybe customers that are not even US based, and since our data is in its majority US based, eh, they might just want to run the platform on their own. Or or because they are tackling a problem that is completely outside of the uh, of the type of problem that we normally tackle. Yeah, and, and, and there are a number of these customers that are using HPCC for areas that we, we wouldn't even imagine before. So open source was a very positive experience for us. Mm. Um, so you mentioned um, earlier that, that it runs on uh, Linux systems. You can get it for, say, Debian, CentOS, all those kind of systems. And since we're talking a little bit about kind of running it yourself, what, what's the kind of deployment like for this? Um, do I just do I install? Uh, do I take like a stock CentOS server and install extra packages from a repository, or do I get a distribution from yourselves and and do it that way? How would I actually deploy this if I wanted to? Uh, well, there are a couple different options, and um, and you could. Uh, essentially go to GitHub and download the entire source code and compile it yourself, although I wouldn't recommend that you do that because it's, a, it's, it's hard or, or might require some, some additional work that is not necessarily needed. Uh, and, and or you can go to our portal and download the binary packages. We have RPMs if you have a CentOS distribution uh, for, for CentOS and, and and, uh, and Red Hat. We have, a, a, obviously, dev packages for, for Ubuntu and Debian and, and RPMs also for SUSE. So you can just download the specific RPMs and deploy them across your distribution. As long as it's uh, reasonably current, again, this is uh, around CentOS 5 or 6 or, or, or the equivalent modern versions of, uh, of Debian and Ubuntu and, and SUSE, it will work out of the box. Essentially, you deploy the package on uh, on on the main node, and then we provide all the uh, scripting and tooling to be able to redeploy that across all the other nodes. Uh, as much, you need to provide as much as a, as a pre-share key, SSH keys for, for this deployment, and everything else is done by the tools that we include. Mm. Excellent. That sounds really good. Um, so, uh, you, sorry, go on. Sorry. Uh, I didn't mention that, I, and I think this is also important. If you didn't have the hardware to run it, but you still want to do some testing, you can also download mm -hmm. the VMs. We have some uh, virtual machines available, and uh, and you can run the virtual machines in any environment. The same exact ECL code that you run, and I I didn't I wasn't explicit on this one. Uh, uh, the same ECL code that you run on a virtual machine will run in one node, will run in ten nodes, in a thousand nodes. Uh, the uh, fact that uh, the ECL language abstracts parallelism means that you don't care really where it's running right now or where you will run it later. Of course, the larger the system, the more space you have for data and the faster it will run uh, as long as the size of the data problem is big. But, uh, but the ECL code needs no modifications to scale across any number of nodes. Mm. Now, um, obviously, I'm a, I'm a huge Linux fan. Everybody who listens to this show or watches this show will know that. Uh, and I was reading in your biography that, uh, since we've been talking a little bit about Linux and so on, that uh, you actually were one of, were the founder of the first Linux user group in uh, Buenos Aires back in 1994. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. Hey, I still remember my first uh, incursions in Linux. Back in uh -huh. like 1990 or so, I was 
I was I was already a Unix user of some uh, flavors, including SEO and others. And I know that SEO now it's gone, but it, at that time it was kind of used. Uh, and and another semi Unix like Xenix and AT and T Unix as well. Uh, and uh, and I also I was also uh, uh, looking and, and using some Minix. And I saw a posting from Linus Torvalds back in the day. This is like 1990 or 1991. I don't even remember now exactly. And uh, and I got interested suddenly on someone that from Finland was trying to develop this little. Uh, Little uh, uh, kind of toy uh, operating system, mm-hmm. and uh, and I started looking into it. And by 1993, I think I was already using a uh, version 094 of the kernel. And I think uh, SLS wasn't that a soft landing system or so, the first distribution on Linux. And then Slackware quickly followed. Uh, and uh, and by 19, early 1994, I founded the uh, I co-founded the Buenos Aires Linux group with another person and we ran it for a few years and uh, and and it was very successful we got but several other people interested in linux and uh, and uh, made it a little bit more popular at the time and and at the time it was a lot harder than now to make it popular now you can say linux in the streets and almost anyone will know what you are talking about at that time people will even not understand what you are referring to mm. Yeah, I mean, so uh, what kind of, what distributions do you use today? You, you still a big Linux fan? Big, still a big Linux user? I am, I am, and and mostly Fedora and and CentOS. Um, although I I did use uh, at different times in my in my uh, history other distributions. I remember using Gen two, for example, for many many years, and uh, mm. and I gave up on it the day I came back home and I found out that they rem- they removed completely X386 so I didn't have a functional <laughs> X window system anymore and I need to reinstall the next uh, windowing system so I said no 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 this is not for me and I went to I think Fedora at that time Ah excellent excellent um yeah I mean I th- I I haven't used Gen2 I don't upset any Gen2 users who are listening I haven't used it for a little while but um I used to get a little bit upset with having to compile everything all the time. Took a while. Um, although you get the benefits in the in the you know speed optimization at the end of it. Just before we get angry emails from Gen two fans. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, so how did you get into into software stuff then? Because I was reading that you used to be a neurosurgeon originally. So you were obviously into software in the early nineties. Did you did you study computing and then get into medic medicine later and then go back? How does that work? I was doing computers since I was in middle school, so I, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, I don't remember a time where I haven't had a computer in front of me of sorts. Started with the typical microcomputers back in the day, and I don't know, remember uh, Spectrum and, and Timex Sinclair and, uh, and others and, and uh, all the, uh, the the old apples, uh, and uh, and went all the, and Commodore Commodore 64. I think I need to mention it because uh, it's oh, wow. a good. Memory. Uh, and uh, and all the way from there, I did my medical career, uh, but I was already working as a consultant in, in several companies. And uh, in uh, and I think I and I always uh, say this. I think it make it makes it easy the fact that I ra- I rode the wave when it started. So I mm. started using the internet when when the web didn't exist. It was late eighties. Uh, it was a FTP mail. <laughs> if you remember that, those were the dread day where you would, instead of doing an FTP online, you would send an, an email with the description of what FTP commands you want to use. And the system back would send you chunks of the file compressed in different emails. And of course, as you would l- always lose one piece of the email, you would need to go back and re-request the entire thing. And all this is over UCP, so it would take days to go back and forth. But I really loved it. I thought that the uh, the uh, internet had a bright future back in the day, even before the commercial uh, entities jumped on it later on. And uh, and I think I was right. Uh, you know, that just reminds me of my old days, too. I mean, I didn't have a Commodore 64, but I did friends that had a Commodore 64. I had the Atari 1200 and 800 before that, so same sort of era. And I remember those those days that you're speaking of, uh, dial-up modems that all went at, uh, you know, squeaked and squealed and, and, and handsets with the, uh, uh, the standard. Well, back when we had standardized phones, even, where you could plug the phone into the acoustic cup, crazy stuff, huh? Back in the old days, back in the old days. I had at the time... Uh, a BBS, a bulletin board system, and I was part of the uh, Fidonet network. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, and oh, yes. using 
started using 1200 volumes modems and went all the way to, I think, uh, 14400 or 16800 or 1912. I think 19200 and uh, that was a Zigzel, Zigzel modem. Uh, but I yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember the old days. Now, um, so I, I also understand, uh, what's your role with the with HPCC, are you uh, are you an architect? Are you actually doing hands-on programming? Are you more of a coordinator? What's your respect to the, the role? At this point, I'm the uh, person leading the initiative, the HPCC Open Source Initiative. Uh, I, uh, in my background in the company has been in different roles. I did infrastructure for a long time, information security as well. Uh, and I, I kind of share still the hat with information security and this initiative. Uh, I, I did a quite a bit of, of hands-on coding. I, I developed some software back in the day, and I, I said I didn't want to mention it here because I'm ashamed of my own Perl code, but uh, like in 1999 or so, or, or even earlier maybe, I coded something called Flavio, which is a, a NetFlow analyzer piece of software, it all coded in Perl, including the daemon that did the collection plus all the uh, graphing. Of course, if you ask me to look at my own code back, I can't even read it, so... <laughs> You know, but my older code, sometimes I can't read it as well. It probably just depends on the state of mind I was in at the time. So uh, it's nice to know that you're, you're a fellow Perl coder from back then, though, as well. So uh, I, earlier you talked about the translation of e, is it ECL? The, yeah, ECL to C++. What's, what's the choice of platform there? C++ seems like a very complex thing to try to tr translate stuff into. Well, uh, all these uh, programmers are, I said before, compiler programmers. They were the ones coding Turbo Pascal, the, the compiler and the IDE and all that. So they are, they are all C++ programmers. The platform is called coding in C++. So it made perfect sense to compile to C++. But we are not that dumb. So we use ECL essentially has an ECL compiler that does compile to C++. But then the uh, compilation process from C++ to machine code is done by GCC. So we try to keep a current GCC uh, version, of course, with the platform. But that means that uh, uh, we don't need to take care about the specific hardware that you're trying to run it on. And as long as it's a, a target available on GCC, it will potentially compile and, and run fine. Of course, Intel and AMD uh, x86, we don't have a currently support for ARM, although we've been looking into maybe support for ARM later on and potentially even support for LLVM, which we don't have either. Okay, and what does it look like as a programmer to interface with this and to try to debug something with so many moving parts? I can imagine my code getting squirted across to you know a dozen nodes, and how do I how do I monitor that? How do I manage that? What's what's my interface as a programmer to try to work out when things go wrong? There, are, there is a ECL that provides for a very good level of abstraction, which means that when you code ECL and you see you essentially tell the system, I need this done. This is what I want to get done. You tell me how to do it. And it provide, echoes back the graphical execution plan of that ECL with all the activities described on the plan. I would say that it's kind of a, not that hard to understand what it's trying to do. And since you can follow each one of the activities throughout this graphical plan, it's, a, it's, it's perfectly doable. The, the debugging on that. But of course, this applies very well when you are trying to do this for four essentially single job at a time. But when you're trying to do the debugging on Roxy, where you may have potentially hundreds or, or thousands of simultaneous queries running, and those queries might be all different, essentially a, a number, a lot of uh, different ECL programs that are concurrently running and they are exposed in a parameterized interface on the front end. The, mm -hmm. uh, the problem of debugging might not be as trivial. Uh, on that case, we have also a fully fledged debugger for, for ECL code. So you can use our debugger as well and, uh, and debug your code. And so how often are you finding bugs in ECL translation to C++? Have you found any bugs in C++ down to machine code as well, checking this out? I'm sure you must have. Ha, there are never bugs. They're all features. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. But, but, yeah, yeah but, we, we, do, we, do find, we do find bugs. And, and, uh, and we've, uh, historically, we found, found a number of, uh, of, uh, of bugs, and, and, and sometimes some of them very pesky. Uh, we, uh, I remember, this is probably maybe five years ago or so, we were tracing a particularly pesky bug, which would retrieve 
uh, which could create, we, we do a lot of scoring. And scoring inf- involves a lot of floating point operations uh, on a, on, across a large number of, of data. And, and many times, the precision of these operations is, uh, is quite high. Uh, what happened is uh, we ended up having certain floating point operations returning a certain result on four and a different result on Roxy. And the difference was uh, obviously an adjustment type of difference, but it was hard to explain why that adjustment was there. Well, traced all this back to it, all this uh, to the fact that we were using in one case vector operations from from or allowing vector operations on on GCC and on the other case we weren't. So the uh, the uh, processor was executing them either using the uh, SIMD instructions or using the uh, uh, the math uh, subsystem, and of course mm. uh, they would provide different results. It's all rounding results, but when you are compounding these rounding, rounding errors over time and, and in a large number of operations, the difference can be significant. The uh, development effort for uh, these projects, are you test-driven? Is it all modern, buzzwordy, and that sort of thing? Or, or do you just sort of code away and hope it all runs? We no, we don't call it away. <laughs> it will be too risky, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and we don't have unlimited resources. Again, it's a it's a mythical one month. Yeah, I can probably have nine women, and they will have a baby in a in a single month. But that doesn't really work. Uh, so we we do we do a, we do have a large number of regression tests that we execute uh, automatically. On a on a regular basis, so on a daily basis, and and every morning we wake up to uh, finding out that the uh, that code now has a regression, and we need to go back and figure out what happened. But this is good because we can quickly pinpoint the cause for the uh, the anomaly and fix it right away without waiting for a for a long time. Or, or uh, we we don't we don't do an, a traditional waterfall type of development. We tend to focus on, on more of an agile type of model because it. It helps to have these short sprints to know exactly what you're trying to accomplish, to break the problem into small pieces and to run with those small pieces, as long as you know the big picture, of course. But yeah, we, we are test driven. And, and I understand that the community edition is your upstream of what your commercial edition is. Uh, how does the governance for that work? Who decides what features go into the community edition? That is a good question. And uh, the reality is the uh, source code, the code base for both editions is the same. This is a, it might sound a, a, a weird, but the reality is that by the fact that we have a single code base, it is a lot easier for us to maintain the platform and to extend it and to grow on it, uh, and also for the community to be able to leverage the, uh, the platform. We do have modules that are outside of the basic platform, like advanced modules for advanced linking, uh, fuzzy matching, specificity-based linking, uh, for example, that are uh, only commercial, they are only binary uh, type of modules that run on top of the uh, of the platform. But the uh, code base for the platform, uh, for both Thor and Roxy and the ECL compiler and the ECL optimizer and the graphic action plans and the Eclipse uh, ID module and uh, the ECL ID, these are all open source and, and freely available uh, components. And they have a single code base. We started with two different code bases. Uh, we tried that, and it was really, really hard to maintain. And at some point, we said the effort is really not worth it. It's better to have a single code base and uh, and be honest with ourselves and with the community. We have the same code base. Let's work on it and let's try to do the best for all of us. Of course, things that are uh, not uh, required for normal operations or for normal use of the platform and are advanced capabilities. Well, those could go in binary modules that you can add later on and buy them or, or whatever. So does anyone outside your immediate project have commit bits then, or is it all just basically done by forking and pulling it in? We, we do have. We are running, and I think I hinted at this before, we are running the project in GitHub, which, by the way, is a, Git is a very nice source control system. Not that we need to make, get into the debate of centralized versus distributed control systems now. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> we uh, have now, we, we changed. We used to use a centralized version control system before, uh, and moving to Git was a significant change, and I would say even disruption initially, to our development process. But it helped a lot. We have developers uh, in, uh, in different countries and different locations, and the fact that you can very easily do your, your fork and then a pull request and get the code back into the main trunks, is, uh, it makes things a lot easier. So uh, we do have external contributors. We, do, we did have some contributions for, for different things, code, uh, documentation, 
uh, use cases. And of course, we have a ton of, uh, well, a ton, a number of bug reports and, and feature requests uh, that, uh, that we try to uh, work out as, as we can. But as in any other open source project that has been closed source before, there is a first period of time where you need to put a lot of effort in, a, in essentially helping the community. You're going to get a lot more requests than contributions. And then the thing will balance itself. Eventually, over time, there will be more contributions, and the requests and the contributions will essentially uh, uh, balance each other. Okay. So, uh, okay, I think I, I think I heard that there's some people outside your little your group. How many people are in the group that you're closely associated with? Then, within LexisNexis, working on the platform, there are about yeah. uh, 50 people or so. Um, outside of Lex Nexus, the community obviously is a lot larger. Uh, I haven't counted in the forums, but there are potentially hundreds of, of them, and, and we have forums, mailing lists, and other, other vehicles for, for communication with them. Um, and, they, and there are several contributors there. We have the contributions on, on C++ code as extensions for the platform, and, and some of some on the scripts or tools around deployment. Uh, we had a lot of well, significant amount of ECL code contributions as well. Uh, and um, and of course uh, documentation and and use cases and uh, and samples also come quite frequently. That that helps a lot because since we are trying to make sure that other people look at the platform, even if they don't think that they have a problem that will fit the platform, having other use cases that might be similar to what they are doing is uh, is always beneficial. Uh, are you at the point yet where you're having your own conventions or user groups for this? We haven't done any of those face-to-face uh, -face user groups. We do have uh, some IRC uh, discussions and and uh, and obviously some some uh, phone calls sometimes that are extended outside of the community. Uh, we have a we have a, a few a, a few uh, community um, key people that have been contributing. For example, there is a person that contributed the integration with a machine learning. C++ a machine learning library. They they built about a hundred thousand lines of C++ or machine learning libraries of, of with different capabilities, and they did integration for a HPCC, essentially all the ECL uh, wrappers. So you can call all these functions from within ECL. So, well, these uh, these people are in the community and they are quite active. So we have frequent calls and 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 uh, we we touch base uh, very regularly. Now. Uh, we haven't done a face-to-face -face convention. We uh, organized and orchestrating a, a convention uh, that will essentially gather hundreds of people. It's, uh, it's not uh, an easy challenge. So we'll probably do that something like that next year, but uh, we, we haven't got around to doing it. Um, could, I, could I build the next Google with this? Is there enough, um, enough horizontal scaling that I could have enough like a huge search engine with this? Yeah, of course. You could build your own Google. We do a lot of processing uh, uh, on our own of unstructured data, and that includes web data. Uh, one of the uh, nice examples on the uh, HP Systems portal is a page rank example on Wikipedia. Essentially, takes the, all the Wikipedia pages. I don't remember now the number, but it's a, a couple million or so, and yeah. uh, and and builds all the edges across them, uh, and then does the iterative processing of the page rank. Which, by the way, sometimes people are confused because they think that page rank refers to the web pages, and in reality it refers to the name of the the man that created page rank, who happened to be one of the founders for Google. So we should call it a uh, ECL rank if you want. Cool, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's 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 an example. Of the biggest this thing could probably go would be another Google sensor. What's the smallest that this would make sense for? I mean, how much? How, can I, can I put this all just in one box and run the entire system? And how little data would make sense for to use this rather than a traditional uh, database system? Yeah, you can really use it on a single box. We I, I, when I we do frequently, very frequently meetups. And when we uh, when I go and present, I take normally my own HPCC in just a virtual machine. I take normally three or four nodes, and this is to demonstrate how data flows on a distributed system. Even it's a pseudo distributed because it's running on my laptop, and the nodes are in the same hard drive. But uh, but it it shows how the platform can scale from very very tiny, just uh, two or three little virtual nodes. Uh, or just one virtual node up to uh, hundreds of nodes, and and even I can reuse the exact same ECL code. So you can go very little, and if you have the needs to scale and add more nodes, you can scale and add more nodes. And scalability is 
mostly linear. So you add more nodes and uh, and you get a factor of like 0 0.9 something on, on scalability, which is which is very good. Now, most of your money to fund this is because you're selling this service, uh, Alexa Dix is selling the service. Uh, are you getting also a, new, a revenue stream from support of this directly or the, or the add-on features of the commercial edition? Yes, we are. We are providing commercial support and, and we have an enterprise license uh, as well for those companies that require uh, the uh, open source indemnity. Uh, that we all learn from SEO, and uh, and yeah. uh, we uh, provide uh, we provide also support, uh, our own support. So if you want to get support from us from LexisNexis, uh, the uh, the enterprise distribution or enterprise edition is what you want to buy. If you are fine with community support or support from a third party, then you can use the uh, open source edition and 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 use uh, the uh, third party support. Very good, very good. Right, we're almost out of time. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to make sure our audience is? I think uh, the most important thing is uh, the platform is open source. All of it is there. There is no nothing, uh, no crippling, nothing, uh, nothing limiting on the open source side. And the most important thing is we accept contributions. We welcome contributions. We would like to have more contributions. So anything that people can contribute to it, uh, and this doesn't need to be code. If you are not a coder, you can write documentation. You can uh, write a sample case. You can uh, help us with whatever. Anything that can, uh, that can help the initiative, uh, it will be very welcome by us. Very good. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you uh, uh, about your project, and good luck to you uh, in future events. Thank you very much, Randall. Very good. That was Dr. Flavio Villanustri. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Dan, what would you think? I thought it was fascinating. A really, really interesting guest. A great speaker. I've, I've got to confess, I, big data isn't an area that I know a hell of a lot about, but um, it seems like this is a really interesting solution. And I think one of the fears that um, that I had looking at it, and maybe maybe you did as well, was the, the kind of an open core element to it. But he he kind of I felt that he reassured reassured me there when he was saying what we want is contribution from people and interaction and and so on. It seems like they're actually doing it for the right reasons, which is which is great. Yeah, I, it's, you know I'm not I'm not a I'm not a big expert on big day either. Although I'm 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 learning. I hear it all around me as a, as the good the new buzzword, the new uh, thing to, to learn about. So I'm probably going to have to study up more on this as well. It's, to uh, but it sounds like a really solid project with uh, and and works well for uh, this particular space. And um, I know we've had some other big data people on. Uh, I guess about six months or a year ago, some of the Red Hat guys or whatever uh, probably provided some. Most of the, but yeah, this is this fascinating guy to talk to. I always like talking to the old fogies like me, you know, that started with the <laughs> acoustic couple modem and the and the the, the little sixty five hundred two based machines, and it's. It, it, it always takes me back. I'm getting now for, God, 40 years, so I guess it's not hard to have run into other people who have also been around for the same amount of time. Mm, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I don't quite remember that far back, I'd just like to point out. But <laughs> no, no, I, know, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's fascinating. I think we could have talked about retro computing for a long time, but, uh, I mean, yeah, it's sticking to the actual, I suppose, the point of it. I think, yeah, as you say, big data is really kind of taking off because um, it, it, there's so much data being accumulated over the years that it's not surprising that now we're reaching, you know, we've had computers for decades and decades now that there's so much data around that needs to be collated and analyzed and all the rest of it. Um, I suppose, you know, it's a simple name, but it, it just is big data, isn't it, really? <laughs> Not what else to say. Well, we're, we're certainly tackling a lot of problems now that we couldn't have even conceived of a few years ago. I mean, to, 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 mm -hmm. to, to look at... The, the search, the, the amount of pages that are searched when you type search into Google or Bing or something and how, how quickly it responds and how you, you got to believe there's, you know, thousands of nodes are each handling a little part of your query somehow. And how does it all get brought together? It's, uh, it's great that we have four, four leading companies like Google and those guys actually working on some of these problems and opening up some of the technologies like Hadoop and things like that so that we have a, a basis to start from. And companies like HPCC here, uh, the this project, making it also available to us in a totally usable form. So, uh, I, it's, it's hard. Again, if you would have asked me at any point during my career, what do you see five years out? I could never have predicted any five-year window. And I don't know if that's the same for you, Dan, but I, it, it just changes so yeah. much. So I have no idea where this is going to go. Yeah, I think it's it's really difficult to predict where things are going to go. But uh, I think if maybe maybe if we were able to do that, we'd go go and buy lottery tickets and other things, and we'd all be set for life. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it is difficult. I think uh, one of the in one of the interesting parts of it for me was the language that they've created, this ECL language um, of their own, which sounds really fascinating. And I was curious to know 
the uh, you know the kind of learning curve and the relationship between it and something like SQL, which I've used before. There's a lot of kind of uh, I don't know. SQL is a very old language, and there's a lot of people trying to get away from it now. There's the whole NoSQL movement, and there's all these different things going on. Um, so it might be interesting. I might have a look at ECL and, and give it a whirl. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is one thing we can predict about what's coming up in the future, and that's our upcoming guests. So let me check the list here and see what's going on. Uh, not ne We have a mystery guest for next week, which just means I still have it open, and I hope I can fill it before next week. Um, we got, uh, <laughs> we got, um, we, but the week following, we're going to do the show that we had to cancel last week, which is KVM. Um, apparently, they weren't aware of the fact that it was a holiday for them, so they had to say, no, we can't be on the show, sorry, last minute. Uh, but we'll put on a couple weeks from now. Just add to the list since we last chatted, uh, Bayrock, which is embedded Linux systems. Hopefully, Dan, you could be on that show and talk about that. Um, Error, mm -hmm. the Err chatbot. Err, yeah, still on there. Uh, one we hope we had for the pirate show, but we didn't get it. We have uh, still on the list Poodle, which is the cutest name I've ever heard for an open source project. That's an online translation management tool with translation interface. Just add to the schedule immediately following that, for good comparison, we have Zenata, which is also an online translation management tool with a translation interface. So they'll be able to contrast and compare themselves uh, with uh, Poodle, which had just been the previous week. Also just added to the schedule, a couple more shows, Cake PAT. It's a big uh, web framework that I know a lot of you PHP people out there use for building your websites. And Yezod, which is also a web framework, but written in Haskell. We've had a couple of projects on Haskell in the show in the past, and it'll be nice to see what they're doing with Haskell for their web interface. A lot more on the short list. If you go to twit.tv slash floss, you're going to see the big spreadsheet link from there, and you can see who I'm be talking to or who I should be talking to. I'm trying to send out emails as often as I can. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus for the announcements of when the shows are coming up. You can also follow us on Floss Weekly on I and Twitter for those timely announcements as well. We have a live chat room. We took a couple of questions from the chat room today. Uh, it's at live.twit.tv. We tape at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays, typically, except when the shows are canceled. Sorry about that. Uh, you can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N. Uh, it's on Twitter. And I'm also Ray L. Schwartz on Google+. I try to post about four or five interesting things there every day. Um, I'm uh, currently in New Orleans for another few more days, which is why my eyes look a little glazy today and how, why my bandwidth is horrible. Uh, uh, I'm back to uh, Southern California again for another couple weeks, and then I'm on my big next cruise going out of uh, Genoa around to Greece and Israel and Rome. So it's going to be a nice, fun little trip for me there. Uh, Dan, where can we find you? Yeah, the best place is always danlynch.org. Thankfully, uh, John's put it at the bottom of the screen there for everyone who's watching. Um, yeah, but that's the best place to go. Um, I post music, uh, technical articles, articles about completely unrelated things like football or soccer, as you guys like to call it, um, over there. Um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, obviously, don't forget to check out Linux Outlaws, which you can find at sixgun.org slash Linux Outlaws. It's a weekly show about Linux and uh, open source, free software, all that kind of stuff. And um, we talk a lot about Android and other things, so you can find us there. Um, yeah, and, and just keep an eye on that. If you want to find me on Twitter or Google Plus or any of those places, uh, have a look at danlynch.org. All the links are there. And the username is Method Dan on most of those sites. So yeah, come along and say hello and let's all be friends. Very good, Dan, and thank you again for being the wonderful co-host for this week's show. I appreciate it every time, your, especially your Linux background, helping me out when I'm a little gappy on that. No problem. It's always a pleasure, and I'm sure I'll see you again soon. I'm sure you will. Very good, and we'll see you all again next time on Floss Weekly.